So for centuries, the second coming of Christ had pretty much been forgotten as a doctrine. There wasn't much focus on the second coming of Christ. Most theologians believed that a great millennium of peace for a thousand years would happen before Christ came. So they were not concerned about the second coming of Christ so much. As a result, people, uh, you know, few people actually studied the prophecies of the Bible. However, at the end of the 1700s and the beginning of the 1800s, there was a sudden awakening of interest in the second coming of Jesus. And we find that in the book of Daniel. Now, when we say there was a sudden interest, we know that God played a role in that, right? There was not just across the entire world people start being interested on their own. It was the Holy Spirit saying it was time for them to discover what the book of Daniel says and what the time prophecies of the book of Daniel are about. It seems overnight... People in several parts of the world began an investigation in the book of Daniel. In Chile, a Catholic priest began preaching the second coming. In England, Edward Irving, Joseph Wolfe, and Henry Drummond began preaching the soon return of Christ. Joseph Wolfe traveled the world even appearing before a joint session of the U.S. Congress to proclaim that Jesus was coming soon. Based on the 2300-day prophecy found in the book of Daniel, Baptist and Methodist preachers led the European movement. At the same time, the leader of the American movement was a Baptist farmer named William Miller. After he returned from fighting in the War of 1812, Miller began a 15-year intensive study of the Bible. He discovered the 2300-day prophecy in Daniel. And at this point, Miller made a fatal mistake. He departed from the principle of letting the Bible interpret itself. In other words, when you find something in one part of the Bible, there certainly is going to be other evidence throughout the Bible that supports the statement. We can't just look at one piece of scripture and say, that's it. That's what I'm going to live and die on. You have to see what other parts of scripture say, because the Bible will interpret itself. It will let you know what is meant by something that may be a little confusing. Since most theologians at the time taught that the earth was the sanctuary, Miller concluded what they thought might be true. Therefore, he began teaching that the sanctuary to be cleansed at the end of the 2300-year prophecy was the earth. He believed the sanctuary was the earth. Then reasoning that he must have said that Jesus' return would come once the earth was cleansed of sin. Ministers of all denominations joined Miller in preaching the second coming. As early as 1842, Second Advent publications had been sent to every missionary in Europe, Asia, Africa, and America on both sides of the Rocky Mountains. More than half a million people attended 125 camp meetings to hear Miller's message of the second coming. The population of the U.S. at that time was only about 17 million. The entire earth was literally caught up in the belief that Jesus was going to return to this earth at the end of 1844. Again, that's the end of the 2300-year prophecy. Of course, when Jesus didn't return, as had been preached by so many across the world, the scoffers and the wicked were overjoyed that we missed the event. But a core group of people spent that night in prayer, and they were rewarded by God. In that, he sent a vision through Hiram Edson that the sanctuary that was to be cleansed was the heavenly sanctuary, not the sanctuary here on earth, as was believed. As they continued their study to view the 
sanctuary, it became even clearer to them. Among those who received the explanation were Joseph Bank, Bates and James White. Both of them received this explanation and were intrigued to study this more. They were right about the date. They were wrong about the event that would happen. The event would be the beginning of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. If you think about it, at that time, was there a sanctuary on earth? You remember when Jesus died on the cross, he put an end to the earthly sanctuary. The curtain in the sanctuary on the earth that was in the temple was torn in two. He was the final lamb to be sacrificed. There was no need for the sacrificial system on the earth any longer. So the sanctuary was not on the earth. The sanctuary was in heaven. Well, how do we know that? Well, we know that when Moses was given instructions in the Old Testament to create the sanctuary on the earth so God could be with them, the instructions he were given were clearly a picture and a model of the sanctuary in heaven. So there has been always a sanctuary in heaven. And that is the sanctuary that would be cleansed at the 1844 mark or the end of the 2300-day prophecy. And Moses, we know, modeled it after the heavenly sanctuary because you can read that in Hebrews 8.5. 1844 marks the end of the longest time prophecy in the Bible, the 2300-day prophecy. It marks the beginning of the first phase of judgment and the beginning of the final work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Now, I may be going through some of this a little quickly, but keep in mind, this is lesson 28. In the previous 27 lessons, we've covered a lot of this in detail. We did a thorough discussion of the judgment of the 2300-day sanctuary. So as I go through this, and some of this may be new to you, keep in mind, we can take you through any of the previous prophecy lessons we've done, specifically target at one part of this or another. So I'm doing kind of a quick summary to get us to the point that we wanted to talk today about, which is Revelation 10. We have studied extensively about this work of Christ in heaven. We knew what Christ is doing and where he's at in the heavenly sanctuary. Equally interesting is what happened on earth in 1844. Revelation foretells a special movement that was to arise at the end of the 2300-day prophecy. In this lesson, we're going to look at the other side of Daniel's prophecy as we examine what happened in the earth in 1844, a fulfillment of Revelation 10. And we'll look first at the angel of Revelation 10 in Revelation 10, verse 1. A mighty angel... He was robed in a cloud with a rainbow above his head. His face was like the sun and his legs were like fiery pillars. Now this is in addition to angels who had earlier appeared. So this angel is different from the ones that appeared. He is apparently distinct from the angels who, the angels who held back the four winds of strife that we find in Revelation 7. He's different from the angels with the seven trumpets that we find in Revelation 8.2 and from the angel at the altar in Revelation 8.3 and from those who were at the Euphrates River in Revelation 9 verse 14. The angel is identified, this angel is identified as Christ. As the Lord of history, he makes a proclamation of verse 6. And what he says is, there will be no more delay. Let's look closer at this mighty one who gives this special message to John in Revelation 10.1. He was clothed with a cloud. Note that although the focus of the vision is now on this heavenly being that we're talking about, the vision truly is about the earth and what's happening on the earth. Scripture frequently associates clouds with appearances of Christ. 
So that's how we know it's Christ. You can look at Daniel 7.13, in Acts 1.9, Revelation 1.7, Revelation 14.14, 14, Psalms 104.3, uh, 104, and 1 Thessalonians 4.17 are all examples that specifically call out that Christ is covered in clouds when he comes. So, let's look at the second point where it says the rainbow was upon his head. The angel's face was as if it were the sun, seen shining through the clouds that enveloped him, which that creates prisms of light. The prisms of light are actually what's causing this rainbow that you see above his head. You think about it, when you see the sun and you see clouds, you can generally find a rainbow somewhere. His face was so bright that it was difficult to look at, like trying to look directly at the sun. Can you look directly up at the sun? It's almost too bright for you to see, and that's what's going on. His feet as pillars of fire, the Greek word used here for feet is podes, P-O-D-E-S, meaning feet and legs, which makes sense that now we understand why they're pillars of fire. It, it is the description used when you translate. In Revelation 1, John describes another person that he saw in vision. Let's note the characteristics of this person that he saw in Revelation 1. Revelation 1 verses 13 through 16 tells us, he was clothed with a garment down to his foot, his head and his hairs were like white as wool, white as snow. His eyes were as a flame of fire. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they were burned in a furnace. It is obvious from a quick comparison of these two chapters that we are talking about the same heavenly being that has approached John. John is describing this in Revelation 1.13 as the Son of Man, who is Jesus Christ. So it is Jesus Christ himself who is giving this revelation to John, and he now continues it. We see the Mighty One has a little open book or a scroll in his hand. It can mean either the fact that the book is opened, and it would indicate that at one time it was closed. You'll remember that the previous scroll was sealed with seven seals in Revelation 5.1. Also, Daniel in Daniel 12.4 had been instructed, if you recall reading Daniel, he was instructed to seal up or shut up the book until the time of the end. This is a reason we feel like we know that we're living in the time of end, not because of just because of this prophecy and that we now understand Daniel because the book is opened. It's been studied and we have been given great detail to understand what's happening at the time of the end. And then we also talked about in previous lessons that you just have to look at the news and you know we're living in the time of the end. Everything is backwards. Good is bad. Bad is now good. Evil has penetrated society in a way that you don't have to even blink and something comes up and you're just astounded saying, I can't believe this, but we're living in those days. And we were told well in advance what it would be like in the time of the end. And we're living through that time. We don't know when the end will be, but we know we're in that time period on the chart of time in history. Which book of the Bible was said to be closed? Well, Daniel 12, 4 tells us, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. The book of Daniel is the only book in the Bible ever to have been sealed up. The book of Revelation we know is an open book. It's a re revealing, hence the word revelation. But the book of Daniel was told to be sealed. This is identification point number one of the movement that is described in Revelation 10. It has to do with the unsealing of the book of Daniel. We read that the book of Daniel was to remain sealed until the time of the end. The book of Daniel was not to remain sealed forever, but only until the time of the end. The fact that we today have been able to understand the book of Daniel 
indicates clearly that we are living in this period of time, this biblical time of the end. And Daniel said, knowledge shall be increased just before Jesus comes back. Everyone assumes that means that we're going to have more technology, we're going to have the internet, we're going to have all this, uh, these great inventions, things that make our life easy. And that may be part of the reason, but this knowledge increased is really more related to the Bible. It's a scriptural source of information. So this knowledge would be increased means that we'll have better understanding of the scriptural knowledge especially in light of the prophecies. I don't know how many of you, I know before I discovered this church, I know I studied prophecy most of my life. I had a bookshelf full of prophetic books to try to clearly help me understand what Revelation's talking about. There are so many symbols and trying to interpret the symbols and figure out what the book meant. It was confusing. And then if you look in Daniel, there's, there's lots of prophecies throughout there that we're like, what? What did he mean by that? It's so interesting that it is very confusing to many. But if you study it and you give it the time to study, you absolutely will see that God will enlighten your mind to understand what that means. We're currently in my home on Thursday nights doing a Bible study on the book of Daniel. And we are going through chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And we just completed this Thursday, Daniel 11, which many people find very, very confusing. It's talking about the king of the north and the king of the south. Well, we went in great detail, spent two and a half hours going through exactly what line by line was meant by each one of those verses. And it is amazing. People are like, wow, now I understand. So I think if you take the time to study, if something's confusing, really study it. And it will enlighten you to say, I get it now. I see the big picture. Now I know God, why God put that in the Bible for me to understand. There's so much in there that people are like, well, I don't know why he put that in there. It doesn't mean anything to me. But everything means something. It just may not be the right time in your life to understand it. But at some point, your mind will be opened and you'll be amazed. I think of Rick Lauer, who's sitting back there, and said before he started listening on the radio to prophecy, he had the same kind of experience. He's like, what? And he was intrigued by what he was hearing. And he said, I have to study this. And since has come and understood the truth and studied the Bible, and he's here every Sabbath, continuing to study prophecy, you never get enough of it because there's always more that gets opened up to your mind. So identification point number two is the movement of Revelation 10 will arise at the time of the end, which we talked about the end of the 2300-day prophecy, which is in 1844. So something happened after 1844 in history that allowed this movement in Revelation 10 to occur. Is there any significance as to where the angel that John saw in vision is standing. If you look at Revelation 10, 2, and the meaning of what he is doing and where he is standing, let's talk about that. He set his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot was upon the earth. Let's remember that waters represents the sea, and it's a symbol of people, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That's been said numerous times in prophecy and in interpreted so. And it's in a populated area of the earth. So that's what the waters represent. The earth represents a wilderness area of the earth, an area not as populated. The fact that the angel has one foot on the land and one foot on the sea indicates that it will be a worldwide proclamation of this message that deals with the unsealing of the books. So it won't just be in populated parts of the earth. It'll also be in places on the earth that are not quite as populated, which tells you it's worldwide. So the movement, identification point number three, is the movement will be a worldwide movement. Then what was John to do 
with, revelation, with the revelation of the seven thunders that we find in Revelation 10, 4. As you see, we're going through each verse in Revelation 10. Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered. There's no further explanation given of the seven thunders. Something about the movement was revealed to John, but he was told not to write it down. So identification point number four, there was something hidden from the movement of Revelation 10. The movement bitterly discovered what that was, and we're going to look at that. The angel proclaimed something related to time in Revelation 10, 6. It says there should be no delay no longer. So the, he's telling us that after this disappointment, that after 1844, the, there's no more delay. We're moving forward. This could not mean the end of the world since in Revelation, there was more revealed to happen before the end of the world. So it's talking about the end of the 2300-day prophecy, which is the 2300 years. In the context of the passage, John is dealing with the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, there are many time prophecies. Each chapter, you could dissect and see how it plays out in these time prophecies. Most of Daniel was clearly interpreted and understood, except for these time prophecies. People read Daniel, understood the stories in Daniel, all the things that happened during Daniel's time. But these time prophecies that were tossed in throughout the scripture of Daniel were purposefully put there. And they were not really understood until after this movement period. They were sealed up till the time of the end when the angel proclaimed, there shall be delay no longer. He would then be referring to the end of these time prophecies. In other words... When the movement of Revelation 10 arose, we would have come to the end of the time prophecies in the book of Daniel. The longest of these is the 2300-day prophecy, which we know is 2300 years because a day is a year in prophecy, and it ended in 1844. We talked about when that movement actually started, and I think I might have that on the next chart. Identification point number five was the movement of Revelation 10 must arise around 1844. In Revelation 10, the mystery of God appears to be his great plan of salvation. This included an understanding of the sanctuary service. As you know, we've done several prophecy seminars specifically on the sanctuary service and the meaning of every element in the sanctuary and how it showed the entire story of Christ and his ministry. The earthly sanctuary service, as I said, was given to Moses, and it was a show and tell of the plan of salvation from the sacrifice of the lamb for sins representing Christ's sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. He was the lamb that was slain. To the transferring of the blood of the slain lamb to the sanctuary, representing Jesus' work as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary after his resurrection. You remember we talked about the blood being transferred into the sanctuary, and then once a year the sanctuary had to be cleansed of all the sin, which is represented by the blood that was brought in, had to be cleansed because the sin needed to be cleaned out of the sanctuary. We talked about how special that day was and how reverent people were because not one sin should not be, every sin should be confessed during that time. Um, it's, it's going on right now. We know this judgment in the heavenly sanctuary. We call it the investigative judgment. It is currently going on in the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus Christ is up there as our intercessor. He is up there in the most holy place. And it is represented by the day of atonement when the sanctuary was cleansed of all sin. When the work is finished and the heavenly sanctuary is cleansed of all confessed sins, then the plan of salvation will be done. 
So people don't even realize right now this is going on, that your sins are being cleansed in the heavenly sanctuary. Jesus is up there working as the, in the most holy place of the sanctuary on our behalf. And people just go about their lives like nothing is different and nothing is going on. You have to understand we are in a very serious part of history where we are told this judgment is going on right now in the heavenly sanctuary. So we have to take this serious. We have to live our lives in accordance of what Jesus tells us that we should do, following his commandments and sharing his testimony. Through the preaching of the movement of Revelation 10, God's gospel message will go out to the entire world. So identification point number six is the movement of Revelation 10 gives the final warning message that prepares the world for the second coming of Christ. What was John to do with this little book? Remember, John is seeing an angel with one foot in the water in the sea and one foot on land. And he's holding this little open book. We see in Revelation 10, verses 8 through 10, that in Revelation 10, 9, And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said, Take it and eat it up. The symbolism here is that John acts the part of those who proclaim the Advent message in the years between 1840 and 1844. They were led by God and found the messages of the soon return of Christ precious to their souls. Their computation of the time was correct, but they were mistaken as to the nature of the event that was to take place at the end of the 2300 years. And the nature of that event we were talking about was the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. In his mouth, it was sweet as honey. So to eat or devour the book as he was told to do meant that people were so enthralled and excited at what they believed coming out of the prophecies of Daniel. They even had the approximate date right. They, the, this pointed to Jesus' soon return. People were ecstatic. They were excited. Finally, Jesus is coming to take us to our heavenly home. It was a sweet and blessed experience, just as honey is to the mouth, to realize they would soon finally see Jesus. The excitement today about this event is blamed on William Miller. However, the preaching of the second coming was worldwide and done by many preachers. There was no such thing at that time as a Seventh-day Adventist church. So if you go to the internet, it says that many of the SDAs preached the second coming. But it wasn't until 1863, now we're talking about 1844, it wasn't until 1863 that the Adventist church was even formed. So this second coming message was proclaimed worldwide. But then Revelation 10, 8 through 10 tells us, after the excitement and the happiness The information made him sick to his stomach. Or as Revelation puts it, it made his belly bitter. When Jesus didn't return, as everyone expected, they were very disappointed. And many even became bitter about it. Several denominations sprang up from this very experience. One of them was the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So identification point number seven is the movement would begin with happy expectations, but it would suffer a bitter disappointment. Why would God let this happen? Why would he get people so excited thinking that he was coming back to get them and then they would be so disappointed he didn't show up on their schedule. You see, we can't tell God when he's to do things that we think he said he was going to do. It it is always in God's time. We may not know the answer to that question until we get to heaven and say, why did you allow the bitter disappointment? But as we can see, the bitter disappointment was foretold in prophecy. I personally believe it was to clearly separate the movement and identify it from all the different denominations in the world. 
There's no mistake in that Revelation 10 is talking about the group that emerged from this experience and formed in 1863 as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which has a mission to share the three angels' message and warn people of Jesus' second coming. Now, we're not saying this is the only church and the only people that are going to heaven. That is not what we're saying. We're saying a church emerged that had a mission to profess to people that Jesus is coming, that his second coming is near. How do we know that? Because we have studied in great detail about the 2300-day prophecy and the time of the end. The two prophetic books, Daniel, there are many more than two, but Daniel and Revelation go hand in hand. And if you do a deep study of all that is said in those books and how they are companion books of one another and they support the same message, that is what we are here for, is to proclaim to people. We are brought here for a time such as this to let people know what the three angels' message says. And one of those is to warn people to be ready because Jesus is coming. We've seen it on the prophetic timeline, and we've got very detailed timelines that take everything out of the book of Revelation and pop it on a timeline. And we studied that in our Daniel Bible study. I handed them four charts, and it was very detailed of every date and when things are going to happen and what was spoken of all through Daniel and Revelation, which kind of brings it clearer in, into focus. So that is the purpose. That's our mission, is just to warn the world. There are Christians in every church, but we're here specifically to share the message that you need to be ready because Jesus is coming, and every indication points to the fact that we are getting close. After the bitter disappointment of the book of Daniel, what was the movement of Revelation 10 to do? Well, Revelation 10, 11, thou must prophesy again before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Revelation 10, 11. Now, this movement received its marching orders. Identification point number eight is they were to arise and go back out into the world again with the message found in the book of Daniel. This church was called by God into existence to preach these three angel messages found in Revelation. Tell the world that Jesus Christ is coming soon. That's our mission. We are the Adventist church in that we look forward to the advent of Christ coming back. And we are trying to prepare people to be prepared for his second coming. Not for a moment can you look around at, can we look around at what all these other churches are doing and try to copy their best efforts. We have a single mission. We are a movement and we're moving towards heaven as fast as we can to preach these prophecies and warn people that the great day of God is approaching quickly. I just went and saw something this past week, a documentary on Noah's Ark. And if you recall, Noah's Ark was the first big judgment proclaimed on God's people. We are living in the time of the second, the, the investigative judgment. And it says in Revelation that it will be like in the days of Noah, right before Jesus comes. People will be eating and drinking and marrying and just going on and enjoying life and not paying a bit of attention to God. And then what happened? We know what happened in Noah's day. There were so few who were prepared. There were actually eight and the rest of the world was gone. That judgment had been proclaimed. We're not saying that we should live in fear of this judgment. We just need to be prepared and understand that there is a judgment. It happened in the past, and it's going to happen in the future. And we just want people to be prepared for that. Don't live your life as though nothing, nothing's different, nothing's going on. Every day I just live for my 24 hours the, and get everything done I can in those 24 hours. God wants us here to do his work to help people be prepared. Whether that's encouraging someone, it doesn't mean everyone has to get up and preach. 
doesn't mean everyone has to get up and teach. But we've all been given spiritual gifts, and we should be using those gifts to encourage God's people, to help them understand what's going on. I think of Jeanette, who I get the privilege of spending a lot of time with, and I have seen her go through every person that enters her life. There's not a conversation that somehow or another God does not come up in that conversation, no matter who you are. She is always pointing to, we have to ask for the Holy Spirit. We have to trust that God's in charge of this. We can't live our life fearful. And it's amazing how many people she has encouraged, even where she lives now. These people just flock to her because it's like honey in, her ma in their mouth. They love what she's saying. They're so encouraged by the message. We're not here as a, as a church trying to tell everybody, you know, change your life or you're going to hell. We're saying, listen, God loves you so much. No matter what you're going through, he's here for you every moment of the day. If only you would ask him. So many of us walk past the opportunity to engage God in our lives. Let's review the eight identification points that we just talked about in Revelation 10. And it gives us this describing this movement that's going to come about. One, it has to do with the unsealing of the book of Daniel, which couldn't be unsealed until the time of the end. It raises at that time of the end, at the end of this 2300-day prophecy, marking the longest prophecy in the Bible. It would be a world to, it would also be a worldwide movement. The SDA church is worldwide, not only with churches, but with private schools and hospitals, clinics, healthcare facilities. We're baptizing over a million new members every year. There was also something hidden from this movement in Revelation 10 as described in the seven thunders. It was hidden until the great disappointment occurred and we understood it. That people had the time right, but they had the event wrong. The sanctuary that was going to be cleansed was not on the earth. Jesus was not coming back to the earth to cleanse the sanctuary and take us home. The sanctuary being cleansed is in heaven, and that is what Jesus is doing right now in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary on our behalf. It must arise at the end of the prophetic time period around 1844, which it did right on time based on what we just covered. It gives the final warning message that prepares the world for the second coming of Christ, finishing the mystery of God which is an understanding of the sanctuary service and the plan of salvation. God has no desire for us to be ignorant. He is not trying to hide from us anything that is coming. He has gone to great lengths to keep the world informed of all his intentions. If we would only open his book and read it, if we would only just listen and have a desire to learn what he wants us to know, we will not be surprised. He does not want that any should be lost, nor does he want us to be surprised. The book of the Bible is full of stories because he doesn't want us to be surprised. He said, look, look at what happened. Look in the Old Testament, full of stories. And it's amazing as we study the Bible in our Bible study, we're amazed that everything that we see in the Old Testament stories, we can tie to what's happening in our day. We can tie those stories to what we're going through so that the, it's amazing that the book is timeless. The understanding of Daniel would be a pleasant and happy experience, but it would end in a bitter disappointment. Well, over 100,000 people were known to be waiting for Jesus to come. When he didn't come, the disappointment was so tremendous. They were so sure but God took care of them because the morning after Jesus didn't return, Hiram Edson was walking home through a cornfield after they had been praying all night asking God what happened. And he gave him a vision in which God told him that the heavenly sanctuary was the one to be cleansed. This makes perfect sense, again, if you understand the sanctuary service. We know that it existed from the time of Moses over a thousand years through Daniel's day. You also recall in Daniel's day, the Babylonians burned down the city of Jerusalem and took captive the Jewish 
folks, and there was no sanctuary left there in Jerusalem. So there's no sanctuary to be cleansed on the earth. So that made sense. It was to go forth and, and with renewed zeal after that disappointment and present to the world this message of Daniel. That's what we're doing this morning, and that's what we do every Sabbath morning, is go through the prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation to help you understand specifically what God is telling us through those books. We preach these prophetic messages of God's word so the world can be ready for his second coming. And we want you to have a complete and clear understanding of this book of Daniel. Was there a movement as described in Revelation 10 that arose and fulfilled these eight marks of identification? Yes. There arose in the mid-1800s a special movement that fulfilled every one of these eight identification marks to the letter. That is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's why I came to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I have been in church my whole life. I have been in a Catholic church. I spent years as a child and a young adult in a Catholic church. I went to a Presbyterian church. I felt the Catholic church was uh, not fulfilling me spiritually. It was more going through the paces and I was not connecting with Christ. And I went to a Presbyterian church and I was there for 27 years and loved every minute of it and served in every way possible and felt good and I learned so much. But I had this desire to understand, I'm like this with movies too, people. I need to know what's going to happen at the end. I can, before I even go see a movie, I want to know, is it going to have a good ending? Because if it's not, I don't want to see it. So I have always had this desire to understand Revelation. I said, if this is the last book in the Bible, why is none of these churches talking about the book of Revelation, so I can understand it. So I filled my library full of books on prophecy because I kind of wanted to know. And unfortunately, or fortunately, several people have different opinions about what that is and what Revelation means. So I did a deeper study. And then fortunately, I was led by God through a billboard sign on the side of a road. Just I prayed to God, said, God, please help me know the truth about Revelation. And there was a billboard sign on the side of the road coming up I-85 that said, Revelation today, come understand. I said, wow, God has a way of surely getting your attention when you pray for things. So I said, boy, I better go see what this is about uh, I was amazed, and I went through, I think it was 40 lessons on the book of Revelation in grave detail at the Evans Auditorium here in Charlotte, and after that, I was convinced. I said, this is incredible. It is Bible-filled. It is interpreted from the Bible itself. There's no man-made interpretations because the minute you ask, there's a reference to another Bible verse that makes it clear. And God really has to work inside you. The Holy Spirit has to give you this desire to want to learn. And it was something that I desired, and now I'm just thrilled to be here, actually standing up here and teaching what I learned. So God can use everyone in any way that he can, but he wants to bring you to the truth. I'm telling you, there is not an accident as to why you're here today and why you're hearing this message. God has you here for a time just like this because he needs you to understand that maybe everything you've ever learned and everything you knew, there could be something different or new that you need to know. So he has you here for a very good reason. He warned us that man would try to change his day and get others to believe it, therefore causing us to break the fourth commandment unknowingly. I did that. For most of my life, I have been going to church on Sundays. So there's a lot that I learned in this process about the truth. And it, we went through diligent studies of the Bible. We don't want to depend on me or anyone else standing up here telling you what you should believe. We want you to go back to the Bible, hence why we reference so many Bible scripture verses. We want you to read it for yourself. At the end of the day, I don't want me standing in judgment before God to be dependent on another person telling me. I want it to be me being accountable for what I believed because of what I was willing to learn and study. So we need to make sure that we study 
and understand what it is God wants us to know. I had to see what God says and only God, because for 30 or 40 years, I've been listening to other people in the pulpit, and yes, what they said was true about many of the books of the Bible, but they never touched on prophecy. So I had to come to that to understand what are we doing here? We're in the end time. What are we supposed to be doing? Just going about our business every day? No, God has called us for a time like this to be able to go out and do his work. He's trying to get as many souls saved as possible. I came to realize that this is a time in history that we are all told what we need to do. I have read that each generation has brought forth a small group of people willing to do God's work and share the testimony of Christ. And I must do that for myself. I must follow God's will and do the same thing. God has a will for each one of you, everyone sitting here, using your spiritual gifts that he's given you. It's the most important thing you can do. He gave you a gift. He said, go and do. And he wants you to use that gift because then you'll enjoy doing what you can do. It'll come easy to you. We should do our best to call out and follow God's commission to the earth and prepare everyone for Jesus' soon return. God wants that no one should be lost. How far and wide is God's last day message to be preached? Revelation 14, 6 says, to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. In other words, the entire world. Today, the SDA church is operating in over 98% of the countries on this earth. It is truly a worldwide movement carrying the message of the soon coming of Christ to the world. There are nearly 20 million SDAs worldwide, and we're growing about a million members each year. Jesus is coming soon. The church of the last day proclaims what message? We see in Revelation 14, 7, the hour of his judgment is come, the SDA church is the only church on earth today actually proclaiming the judgment hour message. Lots of churches are proclaiming God's word, but we are specifically focused on the fact we are living in the judgment hour, and we need to be prepared. This is the only distinctive doctrine of our church. All other doctrines are shared by m many other denominations. There are over 500 Sabbath-keeping denominations but only one who proclaims this central message found in the book of Daniel. Revelation 14, 7 declares it to be part of the special final warning message to be given to the world before Jesus comes. The central message of Daniel is totally neglected by most churches, yet Revelation 14, 7 declares it to be part of the special final warning message to be given to the world before Jesus comes. Jesus declares that he is the good shepherd and knows his sheep. Well, what has Christ done for his sheep? John 10, 14 through 15, I lay down my life for the sheep. Jesus died for our sins. We accept him as our savior. We can be assured of salvation because if we love him, we will obey him. All are of God's sheep in Christ's fold now. Do you think everyone who believes in Christ is currently in the one fold today. John 10, 16 says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. We never forget that God has people in other churches and other denominations that love him and serve him faithfully in harmony with the light and the truth that they have. He will lead them into all truth before he comes. They love and serve him faithfully in harmony with the light and truth that they have been given. They're still his sheep. They belong to him. He loves them and he died for them. Christ's sheep who are not in his fold at the present time will be brought into the fold. It says in John 10, 16. Them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Those who are his true sheep will respond to the tug on their hearts by the Holy Spirit and will come out from where they are and potentially join this remnant church to move this movement forward. There are more people coming into our church from other churches and denominations because they've been convicted of the truth and the new light that has been given to them 
as they studied scripture and heard these truths. We've studied scripture that identifies God's remnant church. Those who truly love Jesus will do what in John 14, 15? If you love me, keep my commandments. There's no way you can say you love God if you don't obey all of his 10 commandments. That's not my opinion. It's from Jesus Christ in John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. Pretty straightforward and simple. Not complicated, and everyone can understand it. How does the Bible describe the remnant who are of the one fold in Revelation 12, 17? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There are so many good Christian folks who believe that they keep the commandments yet they don't keep the fourth one. You can't skip over one because it's like, well, we just don't do that today. Well, you need to be doing all 10. You can't keep breaking a commandment that God has said to remember. Of the 10 commandments, there's only one that says remember because he knew people would be deceived and they would forget. They would go along with tradition and just do what they've always done because their parents did it and it was the right thing to do. And we heard that it was changed. Well, God never changed it. He didn't go back and change the Ten Commandments that he wrote on stone. Who is man that man can decide to change God's commandments? Who are you who think you can change a commandment of God? God never changed it, no matter what happened in history. Celebrating on the first of the w day of the week because Jesus' resurrection, that wasn't negated. Jesus didn't even come and say, hey, by the way, when I die, we're going to change Sabbath to the first day of the week. Never said, never done. Nowhere in scriptures. So we have to remember that we have to follow the Ten Commandments. It's very clear throughout the Bible. They keep the commandments and have the testimony of Jesus, meaning that Jesus witnesses to his church through his prophets, which is why we have the scripture available to us today. John describes those who proclaim the three angels' message in Revelation 14, 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. He's not saying we're perfect, that, you know, all his saints are going to be perfect. They're going to keep all ten commandments. We love God. We try not to break the commandments, but we are sinful, fallen human beings. We do fall. And we may sin, but we repent of those sins and we remain faithful to God. So, yes, repentance is an important part of our life because we constantly have to do that. Satan will do anything to keep us away from God and keep us out of heaven. And we're foolish to go about our life believing that we're safe and secure from Satan. He's like a roaring lion prowling about trying to kill us. Only Our only safety is to believe in God's word and trust him. The final call God gives to his people who are in Babylon in Revelation 18, 4. Come out of her, my people, that ye not be partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. God is calling all of us to listen and become part of the remnant people of the Bible in the prophecy that was just shared with you today. We should all be praying as never before for those around us to hear God's word and understand this end time message. May God help us to continue to preach and teach and encourage others around us.